Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Claudia Tobin. Welcome to the first in our new series of um, the Raw Drawing School's Creative Conversations. I'm delighted um, that to start off the series this term, we're joined by the artist activists Ackroyd and Harvey. They are leading advocates in placing the climate and ecological emergency at the centre of the artistic landscape and are internationally acclaimed for creating multidisciplinary works that intersect art, activism, biology, ecology, and history. In 2019, they co-founded Culture Declares Emergency in response to climate and ecological emergency. And they have extensive experience of working with world leading scientists to activate a greater public discourse on the eth ethics of aesthetics, activism within art making and cultural adaptation to the climate and ecological emergency. So tonight we begin with the invitation and provocation in the title of their conversation. When is a tree a work of art, a forest, a social movement? Acrid and Harvey are going to discuss two projects, their long term project Boys uh, Acorns, currently in exhibition at Tate Modern, and celebrating both the centenary of Joseph Boys birth and Tate's de declaration of climate emergency in 2019. And they'll also be discussing uh, a recent uh, collaboration on the shore with the prize winning writer and activist Ben Oakry, an installation and performance work in two acts from Tate's Turbine Hall to Thames Bankside. So um, welcome to, to Heather Ackroyd to begin with. And I know we might have um, Dan joining us later from Italy. Um, thank you, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and just before we begin, um, I'd just like to, to, to remind anyone new in our audience listening um, that you're really welcome to ask questions um, throughout uh, the, the, the talk or, or later, um, later in the discussion um, in the chat box or in the Q&A box and then, and then we can return to those questions at the end. So welcome and, and thanks very much for, for being with us. Oh, thank you very much, Claudia. And thank you very much everybody for being here and sharing this conversation. So I'm just going to start um, to, is everything showing okay? Yeah, that's all brilliant. Good, right, so here we go. So um, this is some of our social media tags um, and you know, please, please come and join us and find out what else we're up to. Uh, this is actually a piece of work that um, Dan worked on after we returned from an expedition up to the high Arctic with um, Cape Farewell and uh, it's called Lost Souls. <laughs> and it has this beautiful kind of dendritic pattern where the water has eroded into the plaster bays, but it just sort of seems very evocative for the, uh, for the nature of our conversation. I'm actually going to just address some, some really prime important works uh, that Dan and I have um, been involved with over the last 30 years. <laughs> we have a 30 year, history now of working together, 31. And um, I just want to talk about this radical, phenomenal way of making a photograph, um, working with the light sensitivity of the pigment chlorophyll, the green pigment that confers the color green upon all of our, or many of our living plants um, and the algae. And we, we actually express this through the formality of grass blades grown from seed so actually, this is our negative image. It's a close-up portrait of, um, of an elderly woman. We also, also call this piece Barbara. And um, we actually projected this piece to a large scale. So we work with the seed, we plant it into a matrix on the vertical. Um, we create a temporary dark room in the gallery space that we're working with. Um, sometimes we may grow it in an adjacent space or within the city and then bring it to bring it to site. But where we can, we like to try and make the studio active within the gallery space. So this will happen prior to the exhibition. So the grass grows for um, up to eight days for the for the image to imprint. And I'll show you this is the image. So actually what is happening is we've captured an equivalent tonal range that you would find within a grayscale black and white photograph but within these exquisite, extraordinary tones of yellow, almost like a citric yellow through to green. And the principle is, is that where the darkness falls, where the grass is um, denied light, it is still growing. It is actively searching for the light. And in fact, it becomes quite thin and straggly because the grass 
those cells are hungry, it needs the light to start to, um, to trigger the chlorophyll to make the process of photosynthesis. But actually what we discovered through chance, when we very, very first worked together um, on a piece called L'altro Lato, the other side in Italy in 1990, what we discovered was you get this extraordinary gradation of color from this bright yellow through to these darker greens. And you can actually pluck a, a blade of grass out and the, gr the grass grows vertical to the wall, but you can pluck um, a grass blade out and you can actually see within that single blade of grass about 10 different modulations of color. So scale works for us very, very well. It's not gratuitous because in a way, it's like if you equate a chlorophyll molecule to, um, to a pixel, um, then actually the larger the image goes, then our resolution is even stronger, it's even better. So we, we made this discovery very early on in our practice. We were, we, we were very adventurous, very experimental with what we were doing, often experimenting actually within the exhibition space, which could be nerve wracking. Um, I wouldn't necessarily advise it unless you can really cope with that level of stress at times. Um, but what we realized was is that there was a corruptibility to the image, either too much light would corrupt the image, or sometimes we would overwater the pieces trying to understand how the material was, was working. And we would invite, you know, unbeknownst to us then, molds would begin as well. It's called damping off. So in 1997, we actually began um, working with scientists who are based in Wales. And we had a, we had a, a grant from the Welcome Sci Art Award. And they were working with a specialist grass seed that did not lose its color when the grass was under stress. When plants are under stress, they often throw, well, let's talk about grass. When grass is under stress, in a hot summer, you can see that the lawn and the grass starts to, starts to throw off its chlorophyll and it goes yellow. But actually what's happening, the grass is still alive. It's still maintaining its resilience through its root system. So it's holding on, waiting until the rains come or until the water comes. Um, this particular grass does not lose its green color as it's under stress. So this was the subject of a research program through the Institute of Grassland and Environmental Research in um, Aberystwyth in Wales. So in 1997, we started working with Professor Howard Thomas Owen, we call him Sid, become a really good friend as well. He also worked with his partner, Dr. Helen Owen. And we began to understand the complexity of the color green. And this really had a huge impact on their science. And actually they have a whole new um, phenomic plant center, which is based at University of Aberystwyth, um, which it's called I-B-E-R-S, Ibers, and they're doing phenomenal kind of cutting edge uh, research. Um, and I just want to address something that Sid told us. And, you know, I just, take every opportunity where we can to, to say this, that actually, if you put the heme molecule, the blood molecule, our blood, if you take a drop of blood and put it under a microscope and you do the same with chlorophyll, if you're looking at that molecule, then the architecture of both of those, both the heme and the, um, the, heme and the chlorophyll are near identical. They're identical bar at the center, holding it together, holding this heme molecule together, you have iron, and at the center of um, chlorophyll, you have magnesium. So if you think about it on the level that we eat greens, we eat broccoli, lettuce, or we may eat animals that eat the greens, then actually, you know, the chlorophyll flows through us, through our blood, but actually, you know, this, it, it, again, it shows that we are of nature in ways that maybe we don't always realize. So I'm going to go on to some of our monumental architecture work. Um, so actually Dan and I started working together, working in an interior space um, in, um, in a, an Italian village. Um, and then as we were progressing our you know, explorations and our kind of appetite for working with this material, um, we were growing often exterior, or well, not that often, but we would find opportunities or opportunities may be given to us to actually grow the exterior. We did the National Theatre in 2007. 2003, from the very first time we worked together growing this building in Italy, we had this idea to find a deconsecrated church and to grow the interior. And um, we were approached by the London International F um, Festival of Theatre. And they asked us if we would like to do some research or to de develop a program uh, or an artwork around the idea of the poetics and politics of trespass, which, you know, given the way, <laughs> given our full, 
our full-blooded activism now we were kind of adopted that fairly quickly and we said we're very interested in this and after much research and exploring throughout London we actually alighted on this church which is in Southwark Park some of you may well know it and the cafe gallery projects is very close to it so this is um, one of the very first concrete church churches built in London um, but in the style of an early sort of of an early Italianate um, church and it was um, former Clare Mission Church but we loved the interior because it had been stripped of churchy paraphernalia and was felt like a medieval long haul. Um, the place was completely boarded up but it had these tall soaring walls and not such width to the floor so we, we, we realized that we could introduce our materials um, the clay and the seed, this is literally after we've just clayed and seeded it. We took off all of the boards off the windows. The light was glorious, absolutely beautiful. And we grew the church. We actually invited the audience in. And this was October 2003. And you may, you may remember, some of you may remember that that was an incredibly hot summer that led to um, thousands of deaths throughout Europe because of um, heat waves. Um, people not being able to cope with the level uh, extended ferocious heat that they were being subjected to. So this is the light coming through. Um, the architects also had designed, as I said, it was the first concrete church that also designed the very first Wembley Stadium. And as we were growing this church or around the same, maybe it was in the same sort of few months we were developing ideas, then the, that, that first Wembley Stadium was raised to the ground. Um, so there was something poetic again about that as well. And we were very close to a council estate. So a lot of the local children were coming in and families were coming in um, who, you know, some of them said, I'll never go to an art gallery. I'm not interested, but you know, I heard about this. And, and actually they were, they, they just were really kind of um, knocked sideways. They were just really appreciative of, of this piece of work. Um, I'm just going to now, so 2003, when we were growing the grass church, Dilston Grove, um, we had an invite from um, David Buckland, who is the director and founder of Cape Farewell, with an invitation to go on an expedition up to the high Arctic, to go to Svalbard. And we just thought, this is incredible. Um, we, well, I'm, it was, yeah, it was earlier on in that year, I think it was probably May he approached us. And um, we just thought this is such an incredible opportunity. At the time, I decided our daughter, I just felt too vulnerable about leaving our young daughter um, without both of her parents because it felt such an unknown place. And we knew that it was subject to a lot of glacial melting and some strong storms. So in 2003, Dan went up and he came back a different man on lots of levels. I mean, it was such a profound experience. Um, and actually, we, there was another uh, expedition in 2004 that I, I, went, I went on with as well, and also 2005. And Dan also did another voyage in 2007. And he took this Sophia with him and he just held it. And there's this idea that, you know, the, we are turning the world um, upside down. And, you know, often we feel that, you know, it's, it's turning us inside out as well. Um, so Dan also made a drawing on uh, the 2007 voyage, a series of drawings called the storm drawings. They were hit and battered by a really, really ferocious storm that had many, many people feeling terribly ill and very, 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 very scared. And Dan sort of like rallied sort of within this, within this situation. He made this small ball out of, um, he took um, um, a, lab, um, a light bulb and sort of broke the top of it because nobody had a ball. He didn't have a ball with him, nobody had a ball. And made, filled it with plaster and basically made a ball out of plaster, made it, had a tray um, from the kitchen and filled it with inks. And then put the paper, uh, sorry, yes, he basically soaked the ball in ink, put the paper in and then the, the ball was rolling over, um, over the paper, tracing the movement of the boat as it was lurching and veering in the, in the strong winds. Um, when we both went up together, that was sort of about 14, maybe 17 days. Svalbard had um, lots of these whaling cabins sort of preserved by the permafrost. And we were just sort of going across all of these beaches and discovering all of these bones and sort of starting to read a lot about the whaling industry and realizing that prior to 
fossil fuels oil being discovered in Western Pennsylvania in 1859, that actually before then the world was hugely dependent on whale oil. In fact, there was premium prices for, for whale oil worldwide. And it was used in many, many, many applications. I mean, huge, huge lists of applications. And whales were plundered. Whales have been plundered since the 1700s. And in fact, there's enough evidence that actually that Holland had the very first, uh, the Netherlands had the preeminent whaling fleet, uh, whaling fleet in the 1700s, which is also where people start to associate the beginnings of um, capitalism um, emanating from um, uh, Amsterdam, but also what we, what we've sort of researched and understood is that actually the whaling fleet was phenomenally important and over 40 years the equivalent of billions of pounds was made um, for the Dutch economy. So we came back, um, I'm just going to see if I can, actually I don't think I'm going to sort of show this film at the moment, I might be able to show it later um, if we've got some time. Whenever we show um, this artwork stranded. We always show this film, and this was a, a young male minky whale that got stranded on a beach in Skegness. And we worked very closely with the Natural History Museum from 2005. And um, we were alerted via um, a dog walker who alert, alerted the Coast Guard, who then alert, alerted the Natural History Museum, who since 1913 have been doing working on a data of cetacean stranding programs. So cetaceans being whales, porpoises or dolphins that are washed up on the coast of England and Wales. Scotland has its own, um, has its own kind of uh, record and data um, inventory for this. So whenever we are showing this artwork, we always show this film as well, which is blood and guts and maggots. It is, I mean, we flensed this whale for four days on the beach with a very, very small crew. And it was, it was kind of stomach churning work, but we wanted to be, you know, Dan and I are very, very hands-on in our practice, be it clay and seed and watering, you know, which can be at midnight or four or five in the morning. And also we physically want to get involved with, 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 this, with this creature, you know, in its death and understand about the bones. And actually when we cleaned the bones up, it was exquisite, like porcelain, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful exquisite and it almost felt like a travesty to start to immerse it because actually what we did was we then immersed it into these saturated solutions of aluminium potassium sulfate to crystallize this whale. I mean I actually found a level of despondency whilst we we're making this piece. Also we were talking with oceanographers and beginning to understand all about ocean acidification. This is sort of 2005 when the term was first introduced to us and understanding you know, what is happening in the oceans in a way we entered into a depth with this work, which was very disconcerting, troubling, and you know, did create a despondency. It's almost as this piece became more in the grip of these extraordinary crystals, the more I actually found myself being repelled by it. And I've witnessed this in people, people are drawn to it. And then they'll see the, the film and see what was happening to get to this point. And it creates really quite a conflict, I think, of emotion and thoughts. So we last showed this piece, we've shown it, um, it's recently been an exhibition in Paris. In fact, it opened literally as a pandemic, took grip and brought around the lockdown, as we know, this sort of cultural, um, you know, the, you know the, 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 the cultural fallout from this was enormous, as, as we know. But the last time we showed this was in 20, um, 16 actually, I think I've got that wrong, at uh, the David Attenborough, uh, David Attenborough building at Cambridge. So we actually showed many new works. We showed two other very key works there, but I'm, I'm not gonna go into that at this moment because I want to bring us on to um, Voices Acorns. So this is um, a really important and long-term project for us. And it was sort of initiated in 2007, but the idea I think was there in 2000 and, um, 2006, the idea started to brew in response to working with scientists, climate scientists, um, and we were invited for two day events to the University of Oxford, the Environmental Change Institute, 2005. It was sort of an invite, it was a kind of, a, a kind of an invite gathering um, and bringing together world leading climate scientists along with um, artists, you know, from all across the arts, from, you know, um, from filmmaking, 
authors, writers, filmmakers, to discuss the climate crisis. And there were some artists who were saying, yeah, but you know, art can't do that much. It can't affect political change. And, and I, you know, Dan and I would counter that and say, well, you know, Joseph Boyce was one of the founders, co-founders of um, the German Green Party, which, you know, as you know, following the recent German elections, Yes, they didn't do as well as they hoped, but they are probably now entering into coalition and they are a powerful, they have a very, very strong, powerful voice. They are the most powerful environmental green political party in the world. And Joseph Boyce understood, you know, that politics and economics were incredibly important, although his deep abiding passion was ecology and education. So we also read a book in 2007, which was by Jean Genot, the man who planted trees, a fable, but it just completely caught our imagination. And it spurred us on to thinking, actually we could go and collect acorns from Joseph Boyce's 7,000 oaks. So this is Joseph um, Boyce planting the first tree for the seventh documenta um, in 1982. And he was saying at that point, he didn't want to be in the gallery. He wanted to be outside. He wanted to be confronting and dealing with the greatest societal um, concerns and issues, and certainly looking at issues around the environment. Um, acid rain was causing um, huge problems across the, the Northern boreal, boreal forests. And I'm sure, you know, Joseph Boyce would have also had wind about climate change or the greenhouse effect because you know, it has been known about since the late 1800s. In fact, the very early science about climate change was done by a woman called, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, Eunice Newton Foote in 1856. She presented her paper at the Smithsonian. Um, and in fact, all of her findings were later proved, you know, the scientific, scientific method was put in place in 1859 by, um, by John Tyndall, who was a very brilliant Irish physicist. Um, so it's been around for a long, long, long time, this problem. Um, so Joseph Boyce is audacious, brilliant, extraordinary, um, you know, uh, dumping placement of all of these basalt um, markers, each one going to mark the tree. I, I mean, I love this image. I love just the, just the, I, I don't know, I just love the radicalness of this. And Joseph Boyce uses the word radical a lot. And so 2007, actually Dan was in the high Arctic at that point, probably making the storm drawings, feeling terribly ill. And well, I mean, he wasn't so ill, many other people were. I jumped on the train and I went to Castle and working with a young man from the State Parks Department who was really, really helpful. And at the time doing an inventory of all of the trees because they needed to know what still existed from the original planting between 1982 and 1986. Um, 1987, Joseph Boyce died. Um, he actually passed away in 1986 of a heart attack. So his son planted the last tree um, to commemorate, the, uh, to com to commemorate the, the date of his father's death one year later in 1987. So that's a smaller tree. Um, so we came back to the UK, co-opted a friend's um, garden because we don't have a garden and um, she and we, we we had about 649 um, acorns at that time um, the squirrels realized that they had um, a very easy you know come come as you like breakfast so I think they must have had at least 300 of our acorns so we were naive we were naive I mean we accept our naivety we accept it has been you know a kind of a learning curve we have lost trees trees have died on our watch, we have tried our very best to look after every tree, but sometimes, you know, those those squirrels had the um, had the acorns, and other uh, you know other situations have arise. For example, this was shown at um, part of an exhibition, uh, Two Degrees Environment, back in two thousand and nine, and actually somebody took one tree. Um, so these things happen, um, and whenever we show the trees, we have a very um, open-faced research program and we invite in our oh, speakers, scientists, um, community workers, um, uh, uh, curators, architects, um, economists, lawyers to talk with us. So it's wherever our particular interests and um, preoccupation is alighting. And in Manchester, there's an extraordinary um, scientist called um, Professor Roland Enos, 
and um, he was doing some really kind of pivotal groundbreaking work. We know that on a really hot baking summer's day that we want to sit under the tree or if we're walking down a pavement, if we can, if we can hug the shade of the tree, then that is going to lower our temperature and make us feel a lot more comfortable than being exposed, excuse me, within the concrete, you know, with it amongst the concrete and the harder, you know, the harder surface, excuse me. <coughs> So in 2009, there were these research plots that were being um, developed. One was just dedicated to grass. I think there were, um, I think there were nine altogether, um, a tree on one and tarmac on the other. And the scientist, um, Enos and his team of PhD students were doing this raft of data gathering and some incredibly important um, evidence was brought out, which has now been implemented implemented into 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 kind of um, city and town um, governance and planning. So what they were looking at back in two thousand and seven was the problem, and even here you can see they were predicting four degrees centigrade rise by twenty eighty. So um, and actually this is now what the scientists are saying that you know we probably have lost the 1.5 degrees centigrade that the 2015 Paris Agreement was hoping to put in place. And, um, you know, the return to business as usual, the attempts to return to business as usual, is heading us towards a three degrees centigrade. And that's a more conservative estimate. But what is more, where there is, you know, um, glimmers of hope, and where we can see is, is looking at here that if, um, if within city centers, just 10% of, um, of, of that area is planted with trees, adding 10% area of trees to city center cools them by up to four degrees centigrade climate proof in the city until 2080. So this is really, really important. And in fact, I've recently read that Madrid, which actually is probably one of the greenest cities in Europe, is actually creating a huge girdle around the city. They're planting millions of trees um, to try in some way to start to absorb, um, absorb the heat. And I mean, I also think we have to, at every point, uh, understand that that tree has life, that that tree um, also is giving life to multi-species as well. So that tree is doing a phenomenal amount around biodiversity. It's not just, you know, soaking, it's not just trying to um, act as um, a soak up for all of the excessive carbon, nor does it mean that we can still keep putting up or burning anything like the amount of carbon that um, is still being burned. So this is really, really important. Um, and uh, Roland Enos is now at the University of, um, University of Hull, and he's doing a lot of work into flood, uh, water runoff and flood flooding as well. So he's doing some great work. Um, so in 2009, we were invited to show at the Royal Academy of Arts. And this again was through Cape Farewell working with the curators. And it was for a group show called Earth, Art of a Changing, um, Art of a Changing World. And um, we showed the trees. And you can see at this point, they're in these sort of um, pots that we were getting from the recycled um, bins at the local, um, at the local, um, garden centers, but you know the tree is now two years old. I, I was already getting very worried about root about root binding, um, but actually we resolved that thankfully. Um, you know within it within within a few months of of the exhibition. So yeah, it was a really really good group exhibition, um, and you know as I say, we held a series of in conversations with a we had um, with about six six different, I think no about yeah six different guests including writers such as Jay Griffiths, um, Roland Enos, um, sorry, these are repeats. Um, I, must find, I must find the other in conversation one. And the very wonderful and very, um, the late um, Polly Higgins, who was an extraordinary, phenomenal um, environmental lawyer and a very close friend. And she very sadly and untimely um, passed away um, in 2018, I think. Um, so yes, we always had these very public facing uh, open research uh, conversations. Um, so in 2009, we were also invited to speak at the Nobel Laureate Symposium. 
And this was being uh, organized through St. James's Palace, working closely with the uni uni uh, University of Cambridge through their sustainability um, science department. And on the final week of the convention, and this was bringing in world leading Nobel scientists, um, that the Science Museum hosted um, a dinner. And um, there were um, a number of speakers. I mean, I was just, I was just thrilled beyond, well, I mean, to, to meet Wangari Matai, who had been, um, she won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2003 for planting over 30 million trees in Kenya. And she worked very, very closely with, with the women, with the tribal women, um, to ensure that when the tree was planted, that they would also be watered and looked after. So she really kind of created um, this, kind of com this kind of community um, and women were given some money as well. So they could then, you know, earn a little bit of money for their, for their tendency, for their custodianship. And um, this was a huge, hugely important legacy. So um, Wangari Matai passed away in, I think she passed away in 2012. I would really recommend her book, Unbowed. It's just extraordinary piece of writing and really shows, you know, she was the first woman in Kenya to receive a PhD. And it really shows just how brilliant committed, but also she was thrown in prison repeatedly. I mean, her activism, you know, led to her really, you know, I, I think it really did lead to her having a shortened life, to be honest, because she, she, she had to cope with some pretty dire situations. Um, and her life was on the line on many, many occasions, but she was extraordinary. Um, it was also a complete pleasure to meet um, um, Dr. Fr uh, Fritzoff Capra, um, who wrote the extraordinary book, The Tower of Physics, and also to meet Professor um, uh, Wally so um, Soyinka as well. Um, I just want to mention that something that we were beginning to discover as well, not, I don't think in 2009, but it goes back to 2007, which I just want to mention, is that in 2007, and this is again, is when is a tree a work of art, um, and when does it become a social forest? There was a young schoolboy called Felix Finkbeiner, and he, um, as part of the school, part of his class project, he um, was asked to um, go away and research and to do a presentation on a hero. And he came back to his class and he spoke about Wangari Matai and the work that she had done in Kenya. And now when I heard about this, and I think I came across Felix in about, probably maybe around this time actually, in around 2009, um, because of the work, uh, in 2009, 2010, um, I thought, I thought, because I think his parents were environmentalists, and I thought, I, you know, I've got to corroborate this, but I was pretty sure, my hunch, my instinct was, that his parents would have known about Joseph Boyce's work, The 7,000 Oaks. So, Felix goes in, does this kind of, you know, rousing um, presentation about Wangari Matai inspires his classroom who say, we want to plant trees, you know, in, in the school grounds. And, you know, so the headmaster, headmistress said, yes, 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 let's do this really, really good. And then that sort of was picked up and um, was noted in the newspapers. So then at that point, you know, he lit, Felix lit this flame of tree planting that then, you know, sort of like sort of caught, caught into a little fire in the town and then spread like wildfire throughout Germany. Suddenly all of the schools and these young children were getting involved in planting trees across Germany. Felix was then invited to meet Wangari Matai and to become a, one of the ambassadors for the United Nations Environment Programme which in 2009 launched um, a billion trees for the planet. Um, by 2017, um, multi-million trees had been planted. Sorry, I have, a pa I have a paper on this, which I will um, go back and refer to and give you the exact facts. But by 2017, billion, um, yes, billions of trees have been planted and there were, um, thousands of young ambassadors throughout the globe who were all kind of creating this root system of kind of activism and working within their communities, villages and towns, uh, rural areas to really, um, really encourage the tree planting. So again, I think from, from, you know, 
again, when is a tree a work of a work of art? When it when when does it become a social forest? I think you know there's this beautiful interweaving. Um, so actually, at the Nobel laureate, they had they have plants and flowers. We took them all off and we put on each table. We put a voices acorn tree. Um, so between um, we showed the trees at the at the yeah Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts in 2013. Um, so I'm just going to move on fairly quickly now as well. Um, and we showed them in Versailles in 2014. Um, and then around this time, we started discussions um, with um, Nature Addicts um, Project, who are based in, in France and actually um, have been a very strong supporter of our work. And they said, you know, do you have any thoughts or ideas for COP15 in Paris? And we agreed at that point to do a sort of a, a road tour with 110 trees. Um, of Boise's acorn trees, and it was a six city tour. Um, so this is in Bordeaux. We also did Nantes, we went down, and every place we would make a connection with the host, be it a botanic garden or an art center or even a theater venue. Um, and there would be a whole route system of different venues who are involved and dialogues again, every time there would be dialogues and invited guests as well. Um, and actually in, Paris, we did um, a, a, a sort of a piece of work that was born from this, which is called Radical Action Reaction. And this was a work in three phases. And this is the second phase, um, which is the tree ceremony. And this is an evergreen oak, which is a very, very good tree for climate proofing um, our cities because it keeps its leaf throughout the year. And it, um, yeah, and it, it creates habitat throughout the year. So this tree, you know, is a powerful tree for planting. And it may be an important tree for our towns and cities in this country as well, as you know, we are encountering um, further increases of heat as well. Um, I'm actually just gonna talk about this very, very briefly. So we, this is very, very close to where we live. Um, in fact, Dan, um, the studio where we live and work is, was actually, um, uh, Dan's grandfather's and his father also lived here and his parents had an art studio here as well. And this is one of our most favorite places, which is Leith Hill. And Leith Hill was under pressure, um, under serious pressure from about 2010 um, for fracking. Um, sunken lanes, which you could barely get two cars easily through, you know, and uh, they wanted to go up and start to cut down area of the forest and um, start to drill down for oil, but it was a process of fracking. So we got very involved in 2016 um, with this and um, there was, yeah, and actually we did this exhibition and Boyce's Acorns were also part of that exhibition locally here in our hometown in Dorking. The good news is um, it was such a concerted effort I would say there were thousands and thousands of people who stopped this happening. There was a hard core of a few hundred of us. Um, and there were also some uh, people who arrived and set up a temporary dwellings um, in the woods to, you know, by the drill site to stop, um, you know, to stop, stop the, um, the, the fossil fuel companies coming in. So it, that is now not going to happen. We've seen that off 100%. So again, that impact, that pressure point really did work. Um, so the trees um, are now at um, Tate Modern and they opened um, at the beginning of May, um, 100 trees to celebrate 100 years. The centenary of Boyce, he was born in 1921. Um, this was a very, very early picture. Um, you can't walk amongst the trees. They're in these specialist airports um, and you know, we have to irrigate them and we have to make sure, I mean, this is a hostile environment, you know, there's a lot of um, different wind eddies going on. Um, we had to make sure that the trees were secure and were not going to get blown over. Um, the other 50 trees are on the Story Garden at the King's Cross. Um, it's not to, you know, we've had our critics, people don't necessarily enjoy seeing trees in a pot. Um, but we counter that by saying, well, actually, it is a research project that these trees will eventually all be planted. And actually we have seen so many trees being planted on highways or where they've taken, you know, something like nearly 50, 50, well, actually I'm not gonna tie this, tie myself to this figure, but a large number of trees will perish because they're not properly looked after. 
um, if their plant, you know, if their plant is straight in the ground anyway. So we are going to ensure to the best of our ability that when we start to plant these trees, that they're rooted also into community and into a sense of place. Um, and that it's not digging a hole and putting the tree in and then just sort of it our planting our desire to plant these trees and we're working sort of in in a group of seven um, between now and 2027 probably um, to really place these trees um, in different in in different places not just the city um, some will go into the rural spaces but we're looking to align and work um, both with communities and artists and art galleries and art centers and activists who are doing really, really ground restoration, land regeneration. Um, and this is about being very nuanced, really understanding what the needs of place are, what the needs of the people in the place are as well, and how that can be best, um, how, how that can be best, best devised. So we're into this new phase, which is really exciting. Um, October the 29th, it's not official yet, but hopefully there will be a late at Tate and that will be a conversation between myself and Dan and hopefully Ben Oakry. But that all has to be farmed up. I probably should be saying this um, until it's um, totally secure, but hopefully there will be a late at Tate event. And in fact, Tate will be doing um, a Power to Change week, which is about the, their cultural response. Tate declared a climate emergency in um in 2019 so um when i come out of this powerpoint i'm going to show um a couple of films as well so this is just a close-up of a seedling grass piece that we grew in turbine hall with ben oakley's um uh, beautiful poetic words um stenciled into it um just showing you here so we started on i think it was june the 17th and um, yeah, we sort of pinned out or placed out this Hessian base and his words were cut out of um, um, a ply and we placed his words and as the grass grew, his words were imprinted into the grass, a little bit like a photogram, a stenciling. So I'm going to come back to that. But just to bring us back to Tate, so in 2019, the launch of Culture Declares Emergency. On the day, there were 190 um, to organizations, artists who declared emergency. Um, we were about 40 or 50 of us. We worked in parallel with Extinction Rebellion. Culture Declares Emergency started at Somerset House. Jonathan Rieke declared um, uh, a culture and a climate and um, he declared um, a culture and ecological emergency there and then. We locked down or occupied Waterloo Bridge for 15, 20 minutes and then went to the South Bank, to the National Theatre, the South Bank Centre, um, to Tate and then to the Globe. In Tate, we actually had written to Tate, say this was going to be happening. We had a long conversation. We met up with Frances and she invited us in to the Turbine Hall. And um, there was an expression, a desire then for Tate to declare um, we did a lot of work um, with, with artists such as Cornelia Parker, Anthony Gormley, um, um, Gavin Tark as well. Um, Tate held a breakfast in July. There were about 32, 33 people around the breakfast table discussing why Tate could and would declare. And they actually did declare um, a climate emergency in 2019. And they, at that point, also went to 100%. All of the Tate galleries now are receiving all of their um, energy supply from 100% renewable energy firms, which is a, a really important um, step and um, step forward. And they're doing a lot of work on the ground, huge amount of work on the ground, and also working alongside other museums and sharing a lot of insight, intelligence about this as well. So this has been, it was like a cultural, a moving of the cultural tectonic plate to have Tate declare and that has had you know some wonderful reverberations with many other galleries and organizations also looking very very through a very very kind of like hard eye at you know the carbon emissions that are embedded within their activities. Culture declares emergency if you um please have a look at the website it's just about to be completely redesigned 
So it is a little bit like a holding page at the moment. I mean, it is pretty much as it was from last year. We are a voluntary organization. We have one full-time paid national uh, coordinator. She works one day a week. And at the moment we have somebody who, um, Zara, who is working on our social media as well. We are going to be present at the Freeze Art Fair for two hours um, on the 16th of September. We've been invited by the Gallery Climate Coalition who also now are one of the declaring movements. And um, we had conversations with Matthew Slotover, who's one of the co-founders of Freeze um, in 2019. He was very, very keen to get a lot of the blue chip galleries on board. Um, yeah, Thomas Dane has been very active. Listen Gallery have been very active. Sadie Coles as well. And they are really doing some phenomenal work actually and really, really growing as well. There's architects declare emergency, music declares emergency. Um, you know, there are doctors declaring emergency, heritage declares emergency. They're, they, they're springing up and moving and growing all the time. And I have to also say that culture declares emer emergency is inspired by, you know, Fridays for the Future, you know, by the youth movements, um, by councils declaring emergency, but it's also the recognition of the work and the danger that indigenous peoples are, you know, the work that they have been bringing to this over decades and decades, and yet they are suffering terribly in Brazil, are suffering terribly in Congo, um, up in uh, the northern states of Canada, in in parts of Australia. You know, this is a story that we have to change this narrative and this story as well. Um, so, if you would like to join, it'd be fantastic. Um, do have a look um, and you can register. Um, you will be um, introduced to somebody on the declaration support team um, and you, they will help you with however you want to shape your particular declaration of what you feel you can do. And if you'd like to get more involved, there are working groups. We're very, very open. We're a fluctuating group, but it's fantastic. So it'd be great to see you. I'm just gonna um, show a couple of films now of the onshore. How are we doing for time? Are we good? Yeah, we've got time. That would okay, be great. So I'm just going to show the two films and then we can go into some Q&A. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to close. I'm just going to close the PowerPoint down and I'm going to show act one of on the shore. So this, okay. Just going to close that one if I can come out of that one. Just close that one. I'm now going to, this is a work in two acts, so I'm now going to show act two. Oh. 
This earth that we love is in grave danger because of us. They say that the earth has, I don't know, maybe only 50 years of topsoil left. They say, I don't know, maybe we've only got two decades of fishes in the sea. Can you hear the future weeping? In the past, we have used fear. We have thrown facts at people. It seems to be asking too much for people to alter how they live so that life on this planet can survive. Fear doesn't work. Guilt doesn't work. So I thought maybe love might work. We are at a terminal point. It's either extinction or we become a newer, more efficient, more loving species. Nothing ordinary can achieve that. Only love can do it. Our love must save the world. For love is the last power that stands between us and extinction. As an economist once said, there is only one true economy on our planet. And that is photosynthesis. And photosynthesis takes light and it converts it to life and it nourishes us all. I'm a huge believer in the power of art. Um, whilst we are here right now, art is such a fucking threat that the Met Police have raided the Extinction Rebellion art factory. At its very essence, for me, art is the soul of humanity. We are Writers Rebel. <laughs> Extinction Rebellion's very own literary wing. Our mission is to put literature in the service of humankind's greatest challenge, ensuring the safe continuation of ecological life on this planet in all its astonishing diversity. I think for me, we look at the planet and we, we think of the planet as almost inanimate, as solid and fixed, but it's not, it's all in motion. Whether it's the bacteria in the soil, the worms moving the soil, we are part of nature and we need to learn to love that. It's a little fragment of a song came from Mirabella. If you want the pure voice, you have it, so just enjoy it. Can you hear us, future fighting? Can you hear us, future fighting? We are the hope of the world. We are the Thank you very much. Okay, nice that one. I'm going to stop share now. Make sure that's turned on and stop share. There we go. <laughs> So much that was that was fantastic. So absorbing and and galvanizing as well, and hopeful, which I'm I'm thankful for too. You know, you've taken us through so many fascinating projects around the world that's given so much food for thought. So um, thank you, and and um, to everyone listening, um, you're very welcome to leave questions in the chat box or the Q and A. Um, for Heather and and we can we can reflect on those. Um, but I know there's there's been lots of sort of comments coming through. Um, the, the installation was it at um, Dilston Grove? Dilston Grove. Um, someone was saying that they really remember that an utterly memorable installation. I don't know if you can see the comments there, but so clearly you know making such an impact over the last few decades. Um, but yeah, I was I was so I was so. Um, interested in your work with living materials and you know this idea of the living work of art 
and you know those sources that you drew on um uh the man who planted trees was such an inspiration to me um i remember reading it you know as a young child when i was ill and then coming back to it over the years and um and just thinking yeah i was i was i was fascinated by your the way you were working with i think you were you were talking about clay and seed and this really physical involvement with with the materials and do you see that it then as a a collaboration with these living materials with with natural materials because yeah. you're human yet <clears throat> yeah i mean i i do i you know i love the physicality of our work and you know i just sometimes we sometimes refer to it as a little bit like extreme art making you know, when you're sort of high, high up on seven stories of scaffolding on the National Theatre at midnight, which is both thrilling because you have such an incredible view. But at the same time, when you're up against, you know, the hottest April on record and then suddenly you're into these really, really strong winds as well. Um, it can it can be it can it, it can feel quite you can feel quite vulnerable. But um, often I find the actual process of playing and seeding really quite meditative um, and, you know, I, I know with the National Theatre, and in fact, Elaine, Elaine, who just made the comment about the about the National about sorry about Dilston Grove, um, I, I remember one. I think it was the second second morning um, I came in, and just suddenly the enormity. We had a team of about twenty people. We had seven stories of scaffolding on the two faces, the north and the west face of the National Theatre. And I came in and I think my blood just drained away. And I suddenly felt absolutely, I had an, a complete anxiety attack. I thought I was gonna to drop to the ground. And I just thought, I can't do this. I just was so suddenly gripped by fear of what we were doing. I remember Elaine came in and she just said, what do you need me to do? And she just was so open and sort of you know warm. And I just said, oh, can you help do this? And then I just realized all I had to do was to get up on that face and get my hand in the clay and get my hand in the seeds and I'd be okay. And as soon as I was up there, just, you know, putting the clay on and then placing the seed, I just knew I could just get on and do it, you know, and then, you know, we, we could move through. So again, that contact with the physicality of the material, but also the building. People say to us, well, why don't you, you know, put, why don't you spray it on? And, it's 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 a ritual. Mm. It's about it's an embodied it's an it's an embodiment of that moment of material place and building. You know, we're we're touching the fabric of that building, and often our hands, you know, Dilston Grove, our hands were bleeding at times because it was rough concrete and bits of flint. You know, and you know, you 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 are ache you know you saw an aching at the end of these projects. I mean, you're, you're getting fitter as well, mm. and. Um, I just wanted to also say about the, you mentioned the, the man who planted trees. Yeah, yeah. So when I was given that book after, we were staying with some friends in, in Tuscany and we left to go on the train to go back up to stay with family up in, in Venice. And she gave me a handful of acorns from the olive grove from the trees that they had there as well. And, and the man who planted trees. And I love the fable, but what really caught my interest was the afterword written by Jean Genot's daughter, because he was commissioned by the Reader's Digest. And actually the Reader's Digest said, but this is a story about an, a not, you know, fictional person. And Jean Genot said, I am a writer. Yes, it's a made up person. They said, we want it to be about a real person. So he got the money, but he didn't get published. So he left it on the shelf. And then he was approached by a German publishing house who said, we would like to publish your work or something of your work. And at that point, he took down that manuscript, sent it to them and they said, we love this. So they printed that, published it in Germany. And when I read that, I thought, my, I thought that's it. This inspired Joseph Boyce to do 7,000 Oaks. And that inspired us to go that moment and thought, let's go and get the acorns as well. And actually, we later found out it was, it was that book that inspired 7,000 Oaks. Fantastic, gosh, what a story. It's so, yeah, so inspiring. Uh, yeah, it really resonates also. I, I've, I've just been reading, I don't know if you've come across um, Elif uh, Shafak's um, the, the Island of Missing Trees. No, I think there's just a connection because she's, it, it's set in Cyprus um, and, um, part of the it's a real experiment really in in narrative because part of the story is told through the voice of the fig tree that is this witness and it was just making me think about 
you know, the, the lifespan of these trees that you're working with and the relationship that you're cultivating with them. But it's such a act of, of, of um, well, it's such a hopeful act, isn't it? That's the essence of when you, when you look at an acorn, it's a symbol of, of the future, of hope for the future, of possibility. It is, it is. And, um, you know, but interestingly, we showed the trees in 2019 at the Bloomberg, Bloomberg Arcade. And, um, you know, we've, uh, we actually, uh, Willoughby Landscapes, who are a tree, uh, they're a landscape um, and tree nursery down in Kent. They worked with us on the history trees uh, for the Olympic Park, Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park back in between 2010 and 2015. But um, I think we asked if they could help look off the trees because we, we, we'd moved them about two, three times. They were, they were getting, they needed to go somewhere really secure where they could get proper, properly looked after. So Willoughby down in Kent said, yes, we'll look off the trees. They've been fantastic, really, really supportive. And um, we had, you know, over 200 trees down there. We bought, um, we bought 50, 57 trees or 52 trees up for exhibition at the Bloomberg, Bloomberg Arcade. But we were told by the nursery, we couldn't take them back to Kent because the oak processionary moth, which is um, a pathogen, which is now present in every borough in London and in Surrey, and it's spreading out. They're desperately trying to contain it. They were given a clean bill of health in Kent. He said, you can't bring the trees back because of the contamination. and we were kind of thinking, oh no, what are we going to do? And actually, out of adversity, we actually have struck up this fantastic relationship with Global Generation. So they took those trees onto the Story Garden between um, the Francis Crick Institute and the British Library. And if anybody is ever going past, please go in. It's just incredible. They do a lot of work with the local community. They grow, they've got education, they do events, they do, they do. It, it's a really, really dynamic space. Um, and actually they've just opened the paper garden down in Southwark, so the trees from uh, Tate will go to the paper garden, which is a former Daily Mail printing works, and they will go there, and again they do an incredible outreach through community and education, so that's all very exciting, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, I was uh, I was thinking about sort of on that note, of, well, thinking more carefully about materials and, and paper and, um, you know, the sources that the resources we're using. Um, I noticed um, um, in relation to the the Tate um, exhibition um, installation at Tate Modern, you know, the, the, your attention to minimizing environmental impact in the installation of, of the exhibition, you know, um, I think um, I noted that um, on the website that um, you know, the materials were brought by bicycle, care taken to use local existing resources, avoiding single use plastics and so on. Um, and also, you know, um, that there was, it was, it was so carefully thought through, you know, that, that only one image had been used um, to kind of reduce the digital footprint, which is often something that we forget about as well. Um, but so this kind of, obviously this kind of thinking, you know, underpin, underpins your projects from the outset, but I wonder how you convince other organizations, maybe those, I'm, you mentioned that Tate were very much on board and that's, that's, Yes, that's good to hear. Yeah. How do you convince others to, to kind of adopt this approach? Well, I mean, just to kind of come in more to about the detail. I mean, when we came up with this idea of actually floating, we thought cork is a sustainable material, but then again, you know, we thought, well, where are we going to find that quantity of cork? And Kelly Hill, who was working very closely with Writers Rebel, and then she worked with us sort of you know, can she came on board project managing. She's a photographer and artist in her own right, but you know, she said, look, we said, we need, she said, I'll help you. And she said, the Tate had an exhibition using big pieces of cork. She goes, shall I ask them if they've still got them? And you know what? They still had not everything, not the amount we needed, but they had them. So we only had to order in a small quantity of cork, which came from a place in Wales. And he was fantastic. He was, excuse me, completely on board with what we were doing. But this is the rub. They arrive on a pallet and they're wrapped in plastic, yeah. you know? And so then you're shredding off all of this plastic to get to the cork. And, you know, again, the packaging industry is that, that in itself needs, well, we know that the packing, packaging industry really needs to come on board as well. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of how we package art, 
for art fairs and collectors, huge, huge amounts of bubble wrap are used, you know. So all of these issues need to be, need to really be kind of scrutinized and put, you know, really need to be put under the microscope. Um, and a lot of people are doing this work, you know, it's not, it's not as isolated as it was because everybody is clamoring for more intelligence on this. Yeah. I think what happened was 2019 July, Tate declared a climate emergency. They were then working towards the power to change and Culture Declares Emergency were kind of co-project managing that with them and they were doing a huge amount of work you know, with, you know, with, with all of their people with, who work within them, they were looking at every step they could take to minimize harm or to reduce, to reduce the carbon footprint. They worked with Julie's Bicycle, who mm -hmm. came in and did a whole kind of audit as well, which is fantastic. Julie's Bicycle are really good. I've been working with the Arts Council for a few years and have really made some very significant um, interventions and positive impacts on that. So January was meant to be the power to change. We had another big breakfast, about 80 artists came and joined in the bigger conversation. And then the pandemic sort of just moved in and just sort of created the cultural crisis, created this complete paralysis of activity. Um, and I think it has given everybody a huge pause for reflection and thought. And um, Francis did a series of, you know, blogs and a series of podcasts, a series of podcasts. And she says, you know, whilst these big blockbusters are incredibly important and also they bring big footfall in, she recognizes that, that actually it's precarious because there's a recognition that the, the, the greater ecosystem of artists out of the spotlight working in ways that is outside the gallery system, outside the art collection, outside the fairs, are doing incredibly important, significant, dedicated work, kind of get passed over. And I think she recognizes that that really needs to shift. Um, and, you know, the inclusivity, the biodiversity of the art world has to open up and to also look much more towards their existing collection, what they have in storage, what they already hold. So there's less passing over, you know, by plane or by freight to bring big, big shows over. So I think how, you know, craft have just declared emergencies. So they're really looking at this. Um, we try our hardest, you know, there, there are some failures. We thought we'd got sustainable um, um, cable ties. Mm -hmm paid through the nose for them. And actually when we got them and did the res more research, we thought, oh no, you know, it's not what it is, you know. But we really, really did what we could. The grass was composted, the, 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 the cork flotation has been repurposed, recycled. Um, and um, we tried to leave, we've tried to leave. Yeah, we've tried not to, to do too much. Yeah, we've tried to kind of really keep as low as we can embodied carbon within the artwork. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is a there's a question um, um, from someone listening, um, Charlotte Hamilton Bing, and she um, sort of picking up again. I think on that on that relationship you were touching on with text and image and poetry, and um, she wanted to ask about the relationship between your work and, and literature. Um, and, and she writes that um, at university, she has the option to write um, a piece of fiction um, as a companion piece for her paintings. And she wondered if you have any advice to bridge the gap in an interesting way. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's great. In fact, the, the, pa the Paint the Land series of works, which has been initiated by Writers Rebel. At the moment, Jay Griffiths is working. Um, it's a project that was due to happen this weekend, but apparently the weather is going to turn really, really quite turbulent and really quite bad. And that was going to be down at Tintin Abbey. So Jay Griff is working with, um, uh, with, with an artist um, who's very involved with Culture Declares Emergency, Gabby. Um, I think that's now going to happen in March. And um, I think um, Monique Joffrey is also working with um, an artist too. So it's I think this is really, really exciting. And there are, you know, I think of an artist such as Fiona Banner, who's really, really employed language within her work. And, you know, she's really looked at the criticality of language um, and, you know, how she could use it. So she's done some really fascinating work. 
So I think actually Fiona would be a really good artist for, you know, to, to work with for the Paint the Land, which I'm hoping is going to be going an ongoing series um, of work. And the encouragement is, is for, is for it is to spread the idea so that people may go, yeah, I could do this. Even on a walk, you could potentially do a very, very small, you could do it out of, you know, just kind of gathering and collecting stuff and put it up onto the Writers Rebel Instagram. You know, if there's any phrase that you have that you would just like to capture and however you could capture it, whether it's stones on the beach or, you know, you know, sticks or pieces of wood, however, you know, then it would be it'd be great, you know, to have that contributed. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, that that feels like a, we, we we're drawing drawing to close, and that feels like a really good place to end. And and thank you so much for also you know pointing everyone in, in the direction of these different organisations and this sort of I think you described it as a root system um, of, yeah. of um, like a community, and that's that's really exciting to to hear more about. Um, and there's lots of and um, you can probably see all these um, messages of appreciation coming in. Um, in the chat too. So, so thank you so much, Heather, um, for sharing uh, your projects and ideas and inspirations with us. It's been really fantastic and really thought provoking um, start to the to the term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And um, yeah, I hope we can uh, cross paths either through Culture Declares Emergency or, you know, at other events in the future. Definitely. And thank you very much, um, Claudia, for the invite. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks everyone listening. Thank you.